church of Christ was born, then the spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel through the whole shall not be a church. Thank you. 
Father, that's our message to you this morning. We, we sing that. We know that we can sing these things and we know that they're true. Father, that our hope is in you, Lord. We just pray that you hear our cry. Hear our message, Father. Hear this love song to you, Lord Jesus. And just know that our, us as your children, we are crazy in love with you, Father. We're here to be filled. You do fill us, Father. Just continue to do your work in us this morning. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Good morning. My name is Mati. And uh, we in this church are not observant, but kind of follow the existence of Jewish holidays. So if anybody knows what the Jewish holiday is today, the most joyous holiday of the whole year is uh, in the Jewish calendar is called Simchat Torah, which means joy of Torah, joy of uh, getting the law from God. It's today. And I want to just to commemorate to a part of the Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, the sky displays, it, displays His handiwork. Day after day it speaks out, night after night it reveals His greatness. There is no actual speech or word, nor is it voice literally heard, yet its voice echoes throughout the earth, its words carry to the distant horizon. In the sky He has pitched a tent for the sun. The law of the Lord is perfect and preserves one's life. The rules set down by the Lord are reliable and impart wisdom to the in inexperienced. The Lord's precepts are fair and make one joyful. The Lord's commands are pure and give insight for life. The commands for to fear the Lord are right and endure forever. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.
to Moses and make his name and put it up on the floor. Anyone who would eat him can look at Jesus and see. So Moses did the same. He made a bronze snake and put it up on, on the floor. Then when anyone was beaten by his name, he looked at the bronze and he lived. The amplifier said that you know they gave with expectant and they lived. So today I want to encourage you as you come to you know to the uh, second communion to gaze at Jesus and live. Give us Jesus with expectation, especially in this crazy town. This time that you know no one knows where you know this constitution will end. The governments don't know, the doctors don't know, the rest we don't know. But at least we have that. You know, encourage yourself at home, you know, break this whole communion in your home, wherever you are, and gaze at Jesus, and you shall be. So come join us for the communion.
Welcome to Prague Christian Fellowship on this cool day, but it's warm in here in the spirit, right? Um, I'm just curious for my own interest. How many of you have already been COVID positive? Yay. Okay, one. Okay, just curious. Um, I think you guys know we're not meeting for the next two weeks. Uh, depending on what the government says. But I'm going to go ahead and pray for John because we don't have any visitors today. So, so if you're watching for the first time online, welcome. So, Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, um, thank you for your Holy Spirit in this series of this Holy Spirit. And Father, what an incredible gift that you gave us the Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't be able to be even say yes to you or receive you or understand the Word of God. So Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your Word. And I looked up John today as he preaches. And as the Word goes forth, that it would bear fruit, Lord. I pray for John just as we prayed for him earlier, that you would give him clarity, anointing, and Lord, that your word would pierce our hearts today. Lord, that you would show us what things in our lives need to be adjusted to line up according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Amen. So I've got 25 minutes to go through 13 slides. I think that might be a challenge. It's a simple message today, but I'm a teacher and I've managed to make it complex. So I hope that you can pay attention. And as you can see that we're in a series called The Holy Spirit. And today's topic is Our Indwelling Helper. Now I know that some of you, most of you, have heard a few messages already on the Holy Spirit. And so today I want to focus on the application rather than the subject. And so I've subtitled it, Our Indwelling Helper, How Does He Help? Now there's not enough time to come up with an exhaustive list of how the Holy Spirit helps us, right? Just imagine if uh, I asked you to think about all the times that your parents have helped you. Be a lot, wouldn't it? A lot, yes. It's like the Holy Spirit. I, I remember one story from uh, when Kelsey and I first met. I was really impressed because she was 29 and she was moving to a new house. And at 29, I don't know the age of her parents, but her parents were actually the ones who helped her move. Not a moving company, not friends, it was her parents. And then when we got there, her parents helped her paint the new house. The inside, anyway. Anyway, I was very impressed. Maybe one of you have a more impressive story about your parents helping you? To me, that would be a hard one to talk. So, um, we would all be wise to notice and pay attention to all the ways that the Holy Spirit helps us. Uh, but today, I want to focus just on three biblical ways that the Holy Spirit helps each one of us. The title of the message is Our Indwelling Helper. And so before I get to how he helps us, I thought I would give some context that would shed some light on how he helps us. And so I want to start with this word indwelling. Now, if you're a native speaker, that's probably pretty obvious. So for you non-native speakers, uh, what does that word indwelling mean? Where does the Holy Spirit indwell? Inside of us. Inside of us. And I'll give you some biblical support for that. So, hopefully you've got a microphone over there. Would you mind reading just that first verse? And these slides will be on the YouTube channel in a couple of days. So you don't have to... Read everything on there now. But the person who's joined the Lord is spirit. But the person who's joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. 
and to realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who lives in you and was given to you by God, you do not belong to yourself, but to, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Amen. So the Bible says that Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father, and the Holy Spirit is here within us. And so in terms of uh, painting the house, the example of painting the house, uh, the Holy Spirit is not painting the house for us, right? He's Rather, he's painting the house with us, right? He's motivating us to paint. He's empowering us to paint. Uh, but you know what? The bottom line is it's us who do the painting. That's a very important distinction. The other thing I want to draw attention to is helper, our indwelling helper. And you can see from these passages here, um, all three of them are from John, that the Holy Spirit has work to do. He leads us into all truth. He teaches us. He reminds us about Jesus' teaching. And he testifies about Jesus. But his name suggests that he has one more thing to do. And the English Standard Version translation uses the word helper. Uh, my preferred translation uses the word advocate. And it's where we get our English word for lawyer. In Czech, it's advocat. Matija knows that word well. Well, in Greek, it's a paraclete, which means comforter, encourager, or counselor, someone who is called alongside to help. But he doesn't help alongside, he helps from the inside. He's helping from the inside out. He, uh, we paint the house together. He gives us wisdom on how to paint and where to paint. He gives us strength to keep painting. He encourages us to finish the job with excellence. So we see three things about the Holy Spirit. Uh, he works from the inside of us. He's a helper. And the third thing I want to point out is that his help is a gift. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For the spirit that God gave us. So the indwelling helper is a gift from God. Can anybody repeat those three points? Go ahead. As loud as you can. He's what? Indwelling. He's right? He's inside of us. And he's a helper, right? And he's a gift. Okay. So there won't be a test at the end. Okay. So I mentioned I want to focus on three biblical ways the Holy Spirit helps us out. And the first one is spiritual disciplines. Anybody want to give me a definition of what spiritual disciplines are? That's a great example. In fact, there's some examples right there on the screen. Those things that we do to keep our minds stayed on Jesus Christ. Things that we do to keep our minds stayed on Jesus Christ. It's things that we, we actually find them in Scripture that promote spiritual growth among believers. They're habits of devotion, habits of experiential Christianity that have really been practiced since biblical times. And in fact, Jesus modeled these spiritual disciplines for us. You could maybe call them connection points with God. Another way the Holy Spirit helps us out is the fruit of the Spirit. Can someone tell me what the fruit of the Spirit might be? Oh, it's right there on the screen. You know, as we spend time in worship and in the presence of God, we can expect His character to be formed in our lives. And Jesus is our model because He perfectly demonstrated the fruits of the Spirit because he, His life was embodied by love. And finally, gifts of the Spirit. Can someone tell me what they think gifts of the Spirit are? Yes? I have a conscience. Yeah. Having a conscience? Teacher. Teacher. Yeah, these are good examples. 
special gifts which are given for our exercise and they are not fruit of the Spirit, which is important. They're not fruit of the Spirit. But we're going to get to that. That's a great point. So I would say they're guaranteed places of power where God shows up. Ooh, I like that. Ooh. And it's how we do what Jesus did, right? And it means that even in a small, not affluent church, we can do amazing things because the power of God is released through the gifts of the Spirit. So it makes perfect sense how these three are connected and how they relate. Hard work and spiritual disciplines creates the reward of the fruit of the Spirit, right? And we have to be transformed into the image of God to rightly wield the power of God. So God wisely waits till we are mature and we're ready to give us spiritual gifts. How does that sound? Not exactly? What's wrong with that? Well, I want to tell you, this is my kind of logic. You know what? And my kind of logic in the context of marriage has taught me three important words. I was wrong. Okay. So here we go. Uh, can someone read first uh, 2 Timothy 1, 7? Hopefully, can you read that? You have a microphone. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Now, I was meditating on this verse, and it occurred to me that there is uh, possibly a connection here in terms of uh, how the Holy Spirit helps us and wants to help us. And we can start with the, the power, gifts of the Spirit. According to the Bible... Gifts of the Spirit are gifts, right? You didn't earn it. You, you didn't purchase it with your hard work and your wonderful maturity. It was a free gift of God. Why would he want to do that? Well, one example is in ancient culture, acceptance of a gift was an acceptance of an offer. So an illustration of that would have been Isaac's servant bringing gifts to Rebecca. Her acceptance of the gift was her acceptance of the wedding proposal. And you know what? We are the bride of Christ. Right? And so part of our spiritual union with Christ is our accepting of these gifts that God has bestowed upon us uh, without favor. We didn't earn them. We didn't do anything. And yet God wants to bless us and gift us uh, with his power to do his ministry. Now, of course, we all know the problem of spiritual gifts without mature character. So God did more than just give us spiritual gifts. Right? He gave us a new disposition that we would dislike sin and love righteousness. We would want godliness. Right? And he gave us the helper to help us grow into the image of Christ. And we call those character traits fruit of the Spirit. Love. And fruit grows by taking our place in the body of Christ and using those gifts that God has given us. And finally, he gave us these practical tools of self-discipline. And these tools facilitate the spiritual growth process, and we call those spiritual disciplines. So usually if I ask someone, uh, what are your spiritual gifts? I hear something like, well, I like to work with kids or I like to play the guitar. Uh, those are not spiritual gifts, okay? And we have to begin to talk about spiritual gifts by differentiating between natural abilities, things that you're just born good at, like Ezra's born good at climbing trees and running fast and all that kind of stuff. Uh, acquired skills, things that we pick up and we work hard at and practice and get better at, and spiritual gifts that are given by God. Now we see 2 Timothy 1.6 said, uh, spiritual gifts are God-given. 
And they always produce fruit in the kingdom. And when you're operating the gifts of the Spirit, it produces you a deep longing and joy uh, to serve God. And in, you feel like you're in His presence. And those gifts are distributed sovereignly by God. It's not the, the logical process that maybe our society would go through. You know, this, the right, I don't know, height, weight, intelligence, all that kind of stuff. God just sovereignly gives gifts. And um, an example of that is um, God called me to be a pastor. But I was a terrible public speaker. And I never developed that, that gift. I was never a teacher, and God called me to be a teacher of the Word of God. But God called me to it, and He gave me uh, the power to do that. And it's interesting, I'm not a very good teacher outside of the place that I'm called to, which is here. But in the church that God's called me to, I really enjoy teaching. So it's an example of the gift of God. And I just want to say to all of you that God has given all of us gifts. And we need to find out what those are. In fact, on our webpage under resources, there's a link to Google Docs. And there's a gift test. That's a start. Uh, another way to discover gifts is to start serving in different areas. And praying and ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, what gifts have you given me? And start practicing those gifts. Uh, the truth is that maturing in your gifting takes time and patience. <clears throat> so, I also want to mention, I don't have time to go through each individual gift today, but uh, I do want to talk about relationships of the gifts. And we can group them into word gifts that clarify who God is and what He expects. Anybody can give me some examples of word gifts? Teaching, excellent. Thank you, Tom. No, good try, though. Prophecy? Um, prophecy, yes. Exhortation, Doris got that one. Word of knowledge. Wisdom, word of knowledge, discernment of spirits, um, leading. Okay, what about some examples of love gifts? They demonstrate the love of God in very practical ways. I'm sorry? Gifts of help. Gifts of help. Excellent. Service. Mercy. What else? Compassion. Compassion. Exhortation. That was a word gift. Giving. It's a love gift. Okay, and supernatural gifts. What do you think some of these are? They demonstrate the reality and power of the presence of God. Speaking in tongues, interpretation, healing, save some from some other people, miracles, and faith. Excellent. Okay, so what I want to say about this relationship is we need all of the gifts. You know, let's imagine that we were uh, the Bible church and all of our gifts were under the word gifts category and we had nothing left in the supernatural gifts area or the love area. What's going to happen with our stool? Kaboom. Yeah. We don't want to be uh, the prophecy church. We don't want to be the healing church. We don't want to be the Bible church. We don't want to be the street ministry church. Because that narrows who we are. We're the body of Christ, and God has called us to embody all of His gifts and be a balanced church. Other thing I want to say about these gifts is we don't always just get one primary gift. In fact, most people have two primary gifts. And what I discovered is my two primary gifts haven't stayed. My primary gifts started to be leading and pastoring. And it doesn't mean that I don't give anymore, but um, my giving is more of an issue of obedience than joy for me than it was. You know, I was a new believer. I just couldn't wait to give money away. And I don't have that joy 
but I have that joy in teaching and pastoring and uh, building the body of Christ and extending the kingdom. So, and the last thing I want to say about this is uh, spiritual gifts are very different from spiritual fruit. Matthias' point. And I thought it would be interesting to contrast the two. Okay, so we've got here a gift tree and a fruit tree. And, you know, since the Bible uses the metaphor of fruit, we can use uh, different trees to compare the two, right? So can you give me some observations? By the way, the gift tree has gift cards tied to it. It's actually a thing in some parts of the world. Western parts of the world. I think the gift tree had to be produced by man. You had to do something to put it on it. And the fruit tree was born by abiding in that vine, in that tree. The fruit was naturally produced. The fruit was naturally produced. Good point. characteristics of the tree, whereas the gifts reflect the characteristic of the giver. In our example here, it's God is the giver of that gift tree. And God is the ultimately source giver of the fruit tree. We know that from scripture. You guys are great. Keep going. This really slows me down, but I... Maybe, maybe we learn the most this way. What else do you think? The gift has to be received. The gift has to be received. Excellent. Talk to me about timing here. Oh, it takes a long time to make the fruit. It takes a long time to make the fruit. How long did it take to tie those gift cards on there? How, how long did it take to untie the gift cards? <laughs> but the fruit took a long time to grow. Actually, the, the fruit, if you think about it, started as a seed. So if you look at it that way, it took a really long time. Interesting enough, uh, seeds and fruit are actually linked together. Fruit must grow from a seed, right? But it takes fruit to produce additional seeds. So you could say that no spiritual fruit in our lives means no spiritual seeds to plant in other people's lives. What else do you see here? The fruit tree produces more fruit trees. It reproduces. It reproduces. Excellent. Okay, tell me about the durability of the two trees. Gifts and the fruit and dur durability. Well, I see that the fruit tree has to be watered. It has to receive. It has to receive no water. Nourishment. Needs nourishment. Excellent. It's producing fruit with the other one, they're gone as soon as you undo them. Yeah, you get your gifts and that's it. Where fruit is going to keep maturing and growing. That's not this day, but ideally that. Uh, also good and beautiful. Right. But I was just thinking that, let's say it's early in the year, uh, the fruit is vulnerable. Like, if it's really windy or, you know, the blossoms could get blown off or it gets really cold, you know, the fruit could get frozen. And so it's, fruit is a little bit more um, vulnerable, vulnerable to the world. To the world. Interesting. One other thing I thought about with this tree is um, actually with a young tree, you don't want too much fruit. You know why? 
the weight of the tree will cause it to fall over. It needs to grow deep roots in order to hold the fruit. Yes? Can I say something nasty? Um, <laughs> with, with a flash picture, there are uh, servants of the uh, God who have great gifts and not much fruit. And unfortunately, we are observing the news a couple of days. Who had great gifts, some of them are great teachers, which taught me a lot. And we end up the yeah, the gift card could be worth, I don't know, 25 euros, and the apple could be sold for 25 euro cents. And we think, oh, that gift card is much more valuable. Uh, but we have to consider that there's a lot more than one, just one apple on that tree, and they're going to keep growing and growing. result of intimate relationship with the Lord. And then the Lord brings all kinds of animals and insects and people and uh, people to work under that tree and sit under its shade and it gives nests. It's yeah. so, it's so, um, it, it never stops producing in, in the whole kingdom of the world. In so many ways it gives money to people that plant it, that harvest it, and gives them a livelihood, God's provision from it. Mm -hmm. I say go home and meditate on this because I think there's a lot more then we have time to, to dig out. But uh, just remember that uh, growing character takes time. And believers also need deep root and balance, right? Um, tribulation often precedes fruitfulness in us. Same thing in trees. Um, and not everybody bears fruit, right? Remember the parable of the seeds? Different kinds of soil or thorns. And... As I mentioned, no spiritual fruit means no spiritual seeds to plant in others. And finally, spiritual gifts are plural, right? It's always plural. But spiritual fruit is always singular. Have you ever wondered about that? Well, I think it's worth uh, considering. And I would propose that it's singular because fruit represents various forms of love. Spiritual fruit is best perceived as different ways in which love manifests itself. So, Lofa, could you do me the joy of reading these fruit of the Spirit? Joy is love rejoicing. Peace is love resting. Long suffering is love forbearing. Kindness is love serving others. Goodness is love seeking the best for others. Faithfulness is love keeping its promises. Gentleness is love ministering to the hands of others. Self-control is love in control. So think of spiritual fruit as love. And Paul in 2 Corinthians 13, he talks about the superiority of love over spiritual gifts, what he talked about in chapter 12. And so I think that we would do well to value spiritual fruit over spiritual gifts. They both are good, but Paul says that love, this fruit, is even better. Amen? Okay, so you can see that spiritual gifts are given, right? Spiritual fruit is grown, Right? So the application question is, is how do we grow spiritual fruit? And I would say you develop character. Isn't that simple? Just snap. Yeah, develop character. Just jump on it. So maybe a better question is how do we develop character? That would be a whole message in itself. Maybe a book. <laughs> or two. Uh, but I think Paul gives us a, a 
clue in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8. And if you can follow along, if you can, can you see that? If you can follow along, I'll just make some points. It says, make every effort, in other translations, or give all diligence, I would say, to mature, to develop fruit. Um, he says, develop moral excellence. He says, increase your spiritual knowledge. Wouldn't have guessed that one. He says, develop self-control. He says, learn to walk in patient endurance. He says, be godly. He says, demonstrate brotherly love. And finally, walk in love for everyone. And the more you grow like that, the more fruit you will bear. Right? And that's how we develop our character. And I just like to emphasize, remember, the Holy Spirit is not going to do it for you. He's going to do it with you. It's a big difference, huh? Okay, so finally, see, it's a simple message, three points, and I've made it very complex. Okay, so spiritual gifts are given, spiritual fruit is grown. And finally, spiritual disciplines are good. Notice anything in common there? Jeannie! Jeannie! <laughs> Why would I do that? So you'll remember. Okay, so this is, this is an incomplete list, but here are some examples of spiritual discipline. Prayer, meditation, fasting, Bible study, scripture memorization, generosity, solitude, silence, sacrificial living, service to others. And I don't have time to go through any of those, but I would like to say about spiritual disciplines in general, it's like they water the tree, the fruit tree. We practice those, we uh, bring those into our lives, we have to plant them and get them to grow as new habits, but as we do that, uh, it waters the fruit tree. And the good news is we have a helper, right? And the helper is even there to help us with spiritual disciplines, right? An example, any, anybody here ever try flash, flashing, <laughs> fasting in the flesh, like in your own strength? Like you just got to, I'm going to do this. God didn't say do it. You're just going to show everybody. How did that go for you? Not so fun. Not so good. Or how many of you had the experience where you felt led by the Holy Spirit to fast, and you asked the Lord for help to help you through that? How did that work out? Perfect. Perfect. Amazing. How could you do that? Well, you did it, but you had help doing it, right? Did anyone see the post I put on Facebook this week about the, the Word of God? What happens if you read the Word of God for at least four days a week? Oh, yeah. Was in the PCF group. After four days a week, all these different things just changed. And they were doing like surveys of, you know, I don't know how many people, but lots of people. And, you know, they saw like depression drop and... You know, some of these bad habits like pornography a drop or addictions drop or that all these things happen because the control people were reading the Word of God at least four days a week. Like it wasn't progressive, it was like one, two, three, four. They were shocked to find that. And the point is, there is power in spiritual discipline, power to change our lives. So the application question is, how do we develop spiritual disciplines? How do you make them part of your life? And I say, make good habits, one at a time. Yeah? Does that sound hard? Yes? Yeah. Well, I have some good news for you. Lucky, lucky you. And it's 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4. And Hofo, could I call on you to read that as well? You're doing a great job. For his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature. Amen. So God gives us everything we need to live a godly life. He gives us help to serve him with spiritual gifts. 
He gives us help to grow spiritual fruit, and He gives us help to implement spiritual disciplines. So, I just want to emphasize today that if we will rely on the indwelling Spirit that God has given us, um, and it says here that we will um, come to know Jesus intimately, um, we will share His divine nature, and we will bear His fruit. And that brings me to uh, this conclusion. I know you're ready for that. And I'm not going to actually call on him to read the whole thing. Uh, this is a quote from Derek Prince, but I just, I love the part in the middle. It's in bold. It says, Jesus emerges through those whom Jesus indwells. Let's all say that together. Jesus emerges through those whom Jesus indwells. Amen. So, in parting, I just would love if you could remember 2 Timothy 1.7. Let's see if you can remember. For the spirit that God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So I want to encourage you to focus on God, to invite Him to fill you, and to allow Him to live in you and to live through you. Amen? Amen. So I've asked Cindy to come and give uh, a testimony about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Cindy, I want to bless you publicly. I want to bless you to be you. You are just the way God wanted you to be, and we love you. Thank you. Well, that's a good word, John. We can be done with it right there, right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, John had 25 minutes, and I have the wonderful task of talking about the infilling of the Holy Spirit in five minutes. And uh, that's impossible, but with God, it's possible. So I really prayed about there's so many scriptures and there's so many things I read about the filling of the Holy Spirit and what does it mean. But I'm not going to be about the Word today. John already had the Word and he spoke about the Word of God. And I think if all of you are reading about the Word of God, you know that God comes, the first thing is he baptizes you in the Spirit, and then later he fills you with the dwelling of the Spirit. Well, you could also get it at the same time. I don't think there's any rules to God. He does it differently than everybody. But for me, um, I was very surprised by the infilling of the Holy Spirit that came to me because I didn't know anything about it. God had called me to go forth and walk by faith and to leave where I was uh, and drive um, a couple of days drive to where he was sending me. He said, just go to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Two months later, I was in a hotel and the Lord said, get in your car and drive. And, um, and I only had like two days in hotels about ready to become homeless. And he told me to turn left, and so that Holy Spirit started filling me, and I didn't know it. He turned right. 45 minutes down the road, he said, turn. And the only building there was this bright, bright, bright yellow church, and it was like an old restaurant. And I, anyway, to make this story short, um, the Lord said, I'm going to baptize you today. I want you to get water baptized. So I sat out there. Uh, for four hours waiting for it was a Wednesday night and I walked into the church and there was a little little lady there and I had no idea where what this church was and she said we have baptisms in a pool at the pastor's house on Saturday and would you like to be baptized and I was overwhelmed I was like oh God so I started to get to know God in this sending me forth and the next Saturday came I got baptized with all people I didn't know I came out and I felt nothing and I'm really uncomfortable and, um, and so I leave this party and I say, well, God, I don't know what that was. I was baptized as a Catholic and I thought that was baptism. And so I drive back to the hotel room. I walk in the door and I got an infilling of the Holy Spirit in power.